Hello, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Uh, I know James had some some audio issues last time, so I want to make sure that we've got that covered before uh, before going in. You said yes. Okay, sweet, good, awesome. Um, now I'm curious. There's supposed to be music behind me as well, and that wasn't working last time. So let me see. Oh, I need to hit play on it. Okay, is that? Is that music? Uh, is the music coming through? And if it is, is it too loud? Now the music is here. Okay. Is it too loud? Is it good? Let me turn it down just a tiny bit because it's loud in my ears. So, this time... Um, okay, so I can be heard and the music. Tight, 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 tight. Let me turn it down just a little bit more. It's really loud in my ears. I don't know if it what the levels sound like on y'all's end. Um, oh, you know what? Instead of messing with the, the Streamlabs audio function, I should probably be messing with the YouTube audio function. Not mute. Dag nab it. Okay, let me drag that down. That's gonna that's gonna affect what's in my ears. Oh, oh. There we go. All right, can you guys still still hear it well? If not, I can turn it back up. I'm just trying to like, you know, fill the dead space. James says, looks like everything is going well, so that's good. So this time, um, I've actually scanned in the pages that we're reading. That way you guys can read along if you so choose. Um... Last time we went through the prologue, it was basically, uh, for those of you who might not have been here, it was just Sinzu escaping Arkham. We got a lot of, you know, cool details and stuff, but that was the gist of it, was Sinzu getting out of Arkham to enact his plan. Um, it was a really long prologue, so we weren't able to get into the chapters we had anticipated, but that's okay. Today, we are starting with chapter one. Alfred Pennyworth, the Wayne Manor Butler, at 11.42 p.m. All right. It was a simple robbery. An accident of place and timing. The crime was perpetrated by a desperate felon, either too scared or too incompetent to appropriate the... Yeah, to appropriate the petty cash and jewels he desired without use of lethal force utterly senseless and yet that single act of cowardice and violence has reverberated through my life with a force attributable as a rule only to acts of god and perhaps divinity did have a hand in this if for no other reason than that the murders of thomas and martha wayne created a holy warrior though to be fair there was a bat involved as well it is a chilly fall night as I pull the Rolls Royce up to the curb in front of the Mahan Opera House. The Opera House has long been one of my favorite buildings in Gotham City. A huge 16th century stone structure with a lovely vaulted ceiling, windows of exquisite glass quarrels, fluted columns, and a charming sculpted frieze. It is located directly off of Grand Street neatly demarcating where the financial district meets city hall and hinting at some of the city's more colorful 400 year history so i guess gotham must have been built in like the 1500s 1600s gotham is as its name implies a towering revelation of urbanity nestled in the east coast gotham Co comprises a mere 327 square miles and yet is home to well over 8 million with a sustained 3% annual growth. Though attracting fewer tourists than cleaner and more approachable cities such as Metropolis and New York, Gotham is still considered the city of cities. To say one is from Gotham is to be granted an instant badge of honor. We are the prototypical melting pot, the American dream with scabs, True Grit, though it includes three main and six minor islands between the Gotham and Sprang rivers, 
Most of the nation associates our city with South Gotham Island, the first settlement and still the hub of the municipality. From the narrow from the narrow meandering streets and alleyways of Old Gotham to the wide, busy avenues of Midtown and the Upper East Side, Gotham City is a 24-hour town, a cornucopia of sights, sounds, smells, and textures. There is nothing this city doesn't have save for patience, and nothing this city cannot accomplish save for peace. The nation's poorest shuffle... Yeah. The nation's poorest shuffle through the streets of the Bowery over debris-lined asphalt and shattered glass. The nation's wealthiest stroll through the tree-lined streets of Coventry, their imported Italian shoes clicking over six-inch squares of diamond-patterned plaza stone units in mercantile gray and ivory. Understandably, it is a city full of contradiction, incongruity, disagreements, and intrigue, not to mention taxicabs. Even the very founding of Gotham continues to be a subject of great debate. I can tell you with relative certainty, however, that the Wayne family, whom I have served loyally for most of my professional career, came to Gotham directly from Scotland in the 1700s. Currently, in the back seat of the car, a chauffeur, the last remaining heir of that long distinguished lineage clears his throat and rustles a newspaper. You may wish to put away the reading material, Master Bruce. I tell him, glancing in the rearview mirror at his stony blue eye, as his stony blue eyes rise to meet mine. I'm afraid we've arrived. Streetlights gleam off the hood of the car, which I myself polished by hand this morning. As I glide the auto to a stop, the valet, a young man of about twenty, rushes up to greet us. His outfit is ill-fitting and his smile too solicitous. No doubt he is a Gotham State student attempting to earn some extra spending cash parking cars for the insanely wealthy. In the back seat of the rolls, Bruce Wayne sighs and folds the evening edition of the Gotham Gazette. Fifteen minutes, Alfred, he tells me as the young valet opens his door. And not a second longer, please. I understand, Master Bruce, and have synchronized our watches. Bruce's eyes dart to the long-stemmed red roses lying on the seat beside him, carefully wrapped by the florist in creamy brown butcher paper and a raffia bow. Though he is without a doubt Gotham's most eligible bachelor, Bruce Thomas Wayne will not be bestowing these flowers on any young lady tonight. Theirs is a uh, yeah. Theirs is a much more somber destiny. I suppose the same could be said for any young lady upon whom Bru Master Bruce might wish to bequeath them. As the young valet opens the back door, Bruce begins to unfold all six feet and two inches of himself from the automobile. Tonight he is attired in a black silk tuxedo, carefully tailored to flatter his figure without calling undue attention to his strength and musculature a crisp white shirt underneath, and a silvery blue tie and cummerbund, which I specifically, let me, there we go, which I selected specifically to set off the unusually striking color of his eyes. His dark hair is worn short and carefully tousled, and he is, as always, clean-shaven and immaculately groomed. Even his $800 shoes are polished with, to a high sheen. All in all, I think it's safe to say that he will make every best dress list, prove the, prove the social highlight of his host's evening, and in general, arouse frenzies of interest, jealousy, and intrigue, as is only fitting for a beneficiary of his pedigree. He is almost all the way out of the rolls when he turns to look at me over his shoulder, his brows furrowed in affable confusion. What is this thing about again? The annual fundraiser for the Gotham City Rainforest Endowment, sir. Gotham has a rainforest? I hear him ask with wonder as the valet gently supports his elbows and helps him to the curb. I cannot be certain whether this display of confusion is for the benefit of said valet, 
for my personal amusement or for himself as an exercise in self-transmogrification. This is rather difficult to explain, but the rich, conspicuously handsome, cultured dil dilettante cultured dilettante, now heading up the steps of the opera house, is fundamentally a fraud. Were you to follow him now into the fundraiser, perhaps to toast him with champagne, or simply to invite him to your club for a game of racquetball later in the week, you would leave with the impression that the heir to the Wayne fortune is dazzling, decadent, and dumb as a doorpost. He would make sure of it. The truth of the matter is more complicated. Is... In fact, legend. The truth of the matter is that this gentleman, now pretending not to know how many zeros to add to his donation check, will, in a matter of hours or even minutes, don armor from head to toe, hide himself beneath cape and cowl, and spend the rest of the night fiercely protecting Gotham City with an intelligence, drive, and discipline few could comprehend, let alone emulate. The truth of the matter is that Bruce Wayne is really uh, the Batman. Many people spend the entirety of their lives searching for a sense of purpose, a true vocation or calling. Personally, I have never experienced the anxiety of that quest, nor the luxury of it. I thought my world was ending when, at the age of 26, I was summoned from the stage of the Lyceum Theatre in London to my father's sickbed in America. Engaged then in a thrilling run of King Lear as Edmund, bastard son of Gloucester, one of the greatest parts I was ever to play, as it turned out, I was none too pleased to be called away even for something as grave as the passing of my sire. I was even less pleased when the, when the promise he extracted from me on his deathbed turned out to entail a lifelong sacrifice, as opposed to a brief favor or pithy errand. In the grand tradition of fathers before him, indeed including my own, Ephraim Pennyworth wanted his son to take over the family business. I was to immediately give up any thoughts of a future on the stage and instead turn my attention to more domestic matters, specifically those domestic matters concerning the Wayne family of Gotham City. I had already been educated in the way of the manservant, and had shown a particular aptitude for cooking, in which I was encouraged. While I had attended the classes purely to prove to my father that I was not, in fact, cut out for the job, I foiled my own campaign by earning high marks at every turn. There was a degree of fastidiousness in my nature that I was unable to repress. Let me turn the page. The most important part of the prologue was obviously making Zaz canon to the... Yes, that was the most important part. Does this fit with the map from the comics? I'm not too entirely sure. Uh, we plan to like do a Gotham map at some point. Um, but... We, I, I don't, I don't know specifically. Um, let's see, I simply could not tolerate seeing a thing done wrong, much less to be the one involved in wrongdoing. There are really only so many ways to fold a napkin, after all, and one should not possess silver if one is not prepared to see to its proper care. It is utterly foolhardy to put a chambermaid on formal dining services unless your only other option is a stable boy. And to this very day, I cannot understand the breach in social etiquette that allows certain individuals to fail to respond to RSVPs. Before I knew it, I was certified by the Ivor Spencer International School for Butler Administrators slash personal assistants and estate managers. Which is why, of course, I immediately joined the Royal Air Force. My military service felt, in many ways, like a continuation of Butler School. Only in the RAF, I concentrated on learning the arts of attack, defense, and medical restoration, as opposed to estate management, housekeeping, and entertaining. I have never been a violent man by nature, and do not entirely approve of Master Bruce's insistence on putting himself perpetually in the face of danger, or, indeed, taking the law into his own hands, but I did appreciate the science of fighting, if you will. 
That is, though the thought of taking another man's life interests me not at all, the thought that one could do so with merely a precisely aimed index finger interests me greatly. Mankind's physiology is truly a wonder. And so it was with an eye towards efficiency and a greater comprehension of the human condition that I absorbed everything my superior officers had to teach. I specialized as a field medic and hope it is... I specialized as a field medic and hope it is not unseemly to assert that I served my country well. Rumors that I was then drafted into the British Secret Intelligence Service operating there well built operating there well beyond my military tour of duty are, of course, unsubstantiated. The records will clearly show that I left the RAF to pursue a career on the stage. In any case, I thought any expectation of my becoming a butler was over and done when my father summoned me. I took over as the Wayne family manservant with a mixture of dazed remorse and fatalistic self-pity. As time went on, however, I grew more comfortable in my position. Indeed, by the time Thomas and Martha brought home their baby boy from the hospital, I was content with what I was con what I was content with what I then considered to be my fate. I was wrong. My destiny was written in bullets and blood eight years later, when my employers were shot to death in a Gotham City alleyway. They left behind a single legacy, their son. It is to his care and well-being that I have pledged my life. It is to his destiny that I have surrendered mine. Truthfully, I cannot imagine being more proud of him, and yet I grieve sometimes for the life he has lost. If the Waynes had lived, who would their son be today? Would he have become a hero in some other fashion, some other manner, or was Gotham City bound to pay for her guardian in blood? Bruce was six when he saw the bat. His family home, Wayne Manor, a grand estate by any measure, was built high on a mighty cliff in the Bristol district, at precisely the point of where the Gotham River meets the Atlantic, of which the formal dining room boasts a of, of which the formal dining room boasts a magnificent view. Beneath the house runs a series of caves occupied primarily by Eptesicus Fuscus, better known as the Big Brown Bat. Dashing through the fields behind our stables, young Master Bruce once found himself quite literally falling through the earth. He landed about ten feet down in one of the caves and discovered that the page had to be turned. And discovered, before his father could assist him back out again, that he was not alone. He later told us that the bat had shuffled out of the darkness towards him, hissing and scarred as if it had survived many terrible fights. It was the only time as a child, with the exception of the aftermath of his parents' murder, of course, that I can remember seeing him afraid. It is difficult for me not to regard that creature as some kind of harbinger, much like another bat, much later, that smashed through the study window while Master Bruce contemplated ways of intimidating the criminal element he haunted. I would have insisted it was an apparition had I not personally spent half an hour cleaning up the broken glass. How is it that fate, so elusive to so many, presents itself to others in such unambiguous signs and lucid avatars? Master Bruce is a firm believer in self-determination, but it has always seemed to me that the forces at work in his life exceed the inspiration of even a rarefied genius such as his. I never worry. Well, nearly overly much at any rate, about Bruce himself. My fear is that those forces that guide him may one day prove fickle. I pull a small silver pocket watch from my vest pocket and glance at the time. Master Bruce has been inside for four and a half minutes. I find myself wishing that there were an opera this evening. These streets could use the sweet strains of a plaintive aria to soothe them. Or perhaps it is my nerves that could use the soothing. Bruce was only eight when his parents were killed. He was with them on that dreadful night when, walking home from the theater, they had just been to see The Mark of Zorro, a film he had never again permitted himself to watch. They were held up at gunpoint in an alley then known as Park Row. 
I am not certain as to the exact particulars of what transpired, though a witness to it all, Master Bruce has never spoken of that night in detail. It seems most probable to me that Thomas Wayne resisted. He was shot at point-blank range, as was his lovely wife, Bruce's mother, Martha. When the police found him, young Master Bruce was standing utterly still in the alleyway, deeply in shock. His mother's pearls were scattered by his feet, and the soles of his shoes were wet with his father's pooling blood. Bruce's young life had been spared, and yet I felt him slipping away. For years, he moved through his days like a som somnam somnambu- Ooh, that is a- what does that even mean? I'm, I want Google to tell me what that means. Uh? A somnambulist. Eh, okay, somnambulist means a sleepwalker. For years he moved through his days like a somnambulist, silent and locked away in some remote corner of his own broken heart. I went through the motions of daily life with him, trying to keep some sense of stability and birthright alive in the large family manor he had inherited, and in which I remained employed as his butler. But I feared that his but I feared that his will had been irredeemably broken, and then something inside of him changed. One morning, he came down to breakfast with his jaw set and a new steely intensity in his eyes. He expressed a sudden feverish interest in his education, began to arrange travel, began a systematic process of self-governing reinvention. Eventually, he left home altogether, striding out the heavy mahogany door with unflinching resolve. Some instinct told me to wait. I polished the hardwood floors and unused silver of Wayne Manor for nearly ten years, occasionally receiving brief, perfunctory phone calls from places as far away as Europe, India, and Japan. I held the dust at bay, hoping I supposed that Master Bruce would return home, healed, having shed some of his childhood grief. Instead, he came home darker than ever. He came home devoted to vengeance, the knight already quite in love with him. That's interesting. So he's saying that Bruce was, I guess, training across the world for 10 years and he wasn't there. I'm pretty sure that like Night of the Ninja or Day of the Samurai say that, uh, that Alfred was with him in Japan at least. But that's interesting that they're, um, they're supposing it might be 10 years. But let me turn the page. Instead, he came home darker than ever. He came home devoted to vengeance, the knight already quite in love with him. By the time he donned the cape and cowl, I understood that I was living with a man at war. He chose his costume to strike fear into the hearts of the criminals he stalks, though by now many of them are known to experience spontaneous incontinence based on his reputation alone. Batman is terrifying, demonic. I can imagine no adversary more daunting. It is not just his physical aptitude or his faultless detective skills that make him so formidable. Batman possesses remarkable resolve. It is not humanly possible for one man to protect an entire city. Every night, crimes are committed that he cannot attend. Lives are lost that he cannot save. Batman knows this, and every night he goes out anyway. The very thought exhausts me to my bones. Another glance at my watch verifies that it is time to rescue my employer from the hell of caviar and Cartier in which he currently finds himself. I step carefully out of the rolls and make my way up the wide stone steps of the opera house. A quick word with the doorman grants me instant access to the building, which tonight is brightly lit by crystal chandeliers and filled to the brim with social socialites, philanthropists, and bon vivants of every ilk. The dresses of the ladies shine in satin rainbows of crimson, emerald, and peacock blue, while the men are a traditional sea of black and white. They all stroll about the circular entrance hall, balancing drinks served in real crystal and small paper plates of food. I am shocked to notice a young woman, properly attired in white shirt, 
black slacks, and apron, offering around a silver tray of room temperature tapenade on garlic crostini, while on a nearby buffet table, a platter of baked brie with sun-dried tomatoes goes cold. I am about to ask to speak with the catering manager when I hear my employer's boisterous laugh a few feet away. I elbow through the crowd until I see him, predictably sandwiched between the rainforest endowment treasurer and a supermodel. He beams as I approach. Hey, Alfred! He shouts over the din of laughter, clinking glasses, and a hired string quartet. He gestures to the young lady. This is Eureka! Ulrika, the model corrects him in a thick Swedish accent. All right, uh, Bruce laughs. I clear my throat. Terribly sorry to interrupt you, Master Bruce, but I just received word that your presence has been requested at the Sultan Sore across town. Eureka, Bruce says, unfazed, body turned towards the supermodel, but hand gesturing towards me. This is my butler, Alfred Pennyworth. He leans in closer to the young woman and, dropping his voice, huskily stage whispers, He's nearly as much of a peach as you are. Charmed, Ulrika says tightly between clenched teeth, miraculously devoid of the shining red gloss that covers the rest of her mouth. I am left with the impression that she prefers not to be on a first-name basis with the help. A quick glance around the room confirms that Master Bruce has, as usual, made a wise choice of evening companions. Ulrika is stunning, nearly as tall as Bruce himself. Her long blonde hair, pulled sever severely back from her high forehead and cheekbones before being left to coil coyly around one shoulder, her other marvelously sculptured shoulder left bare by the tight scarlet gown into which she has poured herself. The feline cast of her smoky eyes reminds me of another young woman in the opposite circumstances. That is, one for whom Bruce has actual feelings, but who accordingly could not hope to wrap herself around his arm in public. Uh, but Miss, oh, hold on, I gotta, I gotta switch the page. I need to be more on top of that. I like that they're going into Alfred's backstory. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's definitely a lot of interesting stuff going on there. Learning about his dad and like his time in the Air Force and all that stuff. I was about to think that like this didn't match up because like we know from what is it, the Lion and the Unicorn, that like he was in the Secret Service and everything. But they even included that in there, so that was a, that was nice. What a strange line. I must have missed which line that was. Is he just having a late life crisis as he sits in the car? Yeah, I mean, that's a... Uh, I feel like Alfred's entire life is a, uh, you know... He's left with his thoughts a lot. So, I really like that we're getting stuff like this. Um, let's see. The... F Where was I? Oh, yeah. But Miss Ulrika is from out of town, and therefore unlikely to converse with available Gotham maidens as to Mr. Wayne's dating history. We wouldn't want her learning, after all, that the city's most notorious playboy manages to develop a headache before midnight during nearly every social engagement, or that on those nights when he does not, he nonetheless finds he must retire early and alone in preparation for a corporate conference call the next day. Ah, yes, business. Perhaps one uses the term uh, dilettante to describe Master Bruce a tad misleadingly. Master Bruce is, in fact, the CEO of Wayne Enterprises, one of the largest and most respected business conglomerates in Gotham, along with LexCorp and Multigon. So I guess LexCorp ha has setups in... Um in Gotham. That's interesting to know. That's probably something I need to pass on to Ted. I'm pretty sure we had set up a LexCorp building in Legacies in the in that 2019 issue. So that's that's interesting that like it's definitely um pre-established. Which one was Multigon though? Cuz I remember was that the the from the Riddler episode Multigon DCAU. Google it. Oh, 
Oh, it was the front for 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 Red Claw and um in Cat and the Claw. Okay. So they're uh they're really leaning into some Red Claw stuff then. They've got the multi gun. They've got the the secret service. Maybe she'll show up in the book. Um, no, where was I? Oh yeah, Wayne Enterprises, which includes subsidiaries such as Wayne Tech, Wayne Chemical Refinery, the Wayne Foundation, and Wayne Medical, employs over three hundred and forty thousand employees locally, and is involved in everything from technological research to social philanthropy. And yet. Despite the company's reputation for cutting-edge business models, innovative product construction, and highly ethical hiring and environmental policies, Wayne Enterprises CEO is widely regarded as a dense, if decorative, figurehead. The business's success is generally attributed to the genius of VP of Operations, Lucius Fox, who is indeed one of the greatest minds in business and an invaluable resource to Master Bruce. Even Mr. Fox himself is not entirely sure what to make of his occasionally brilliant but often laughably thick employer, which, I assure you, is just as Master Bruce intends it. One must operate with a tremendous degree of discretion when one is secretly using company resources to fund a one-man war against crime, including, but not limited to, the creation of state-of-the-art crime-fighting equipment such as batarangs, knockout gas, and the Batmobile. I worry that it must sometimes be unpleasant for Master Bruce to risk tarnishing his father's reputation with his own face of incompetence. Though, admittedly, there is no sign of that now as he extracts himself from Miss Ulrika's stu studiously phlegmatic embrace. Phlegmatic. Huh. I'll call you! He shouts to her cheerfully as he begins to follow me back through the crowd towards the main door. Miss Ulrika says nothing but a quick glance over my shoulder confirms that her eyes remain hungrily focused on his retreating back. Okay, I mean... <laughs> I've got a guest over my shoulder. Surprise, there she is. Uh, shall I ask... Shall I add her to the Rolodex? I inquire dryly, holding the door for him as he fetches his coat. He doesn't get a foot past coat check before being besieged by three charming, if somewhat superficial, young ladies, all intent on delaying his escape. Brucey, you never called me, chides the smallest of the bunch. She is an appealing grown She is in an appealing gown of pink satin and cannot stop beaming at Master Bruce to save her life. Bambi he smiles back. Bunny, she corrects with a mock pout. Bootsy, he says apologetically. Forgive me, I thought of you the whole time I was in the Alps. Damn, I thought we were actually going with Miss Bambi. That's alright, I'll go with Bunny. Bunny Vreeland, who's not born yet. The Alps, she asks, a look of confusion clouding her otherwise spring fresh face. Yeah, you know, I was remembering that time we went skiing together. That was me, interjects one of her companions. This one, a bosomy redhead in a yellow dress of tulle. Master Bruce looks su suitably confused, prompting a nervous giggle from Miss Bunny. Oh, Brucey, really, you're too much. And yet, never quite enough, mutters the redhead. I disguise an upward twitch of my mouth with a quick, discreet, and, of course, hand-covered cough. I don't think I've ever been skiing, muses Miss Bunny. We'll have to go then, Master Bruce asserts, waving and all but pushing me out of the door ahead of him. Nice to see you again, Bambi, Joni, Bunny, Jody! I thought you said Selena would be here tonight. He, he, oh, I started doing my kind of Alfred voice. I thought you said Selena would be here tonight. He hisses into my ear as soon as I shut the door behind us, catching me off guard. Selena Kyle, better known as Catwoman, is Le Objet de Affection, to whom I alluded earlier. I believe I mentioned only that this seemed the sort of event Miss Kyle might be interested in attending. 
As you well know, she is not in the habit of appearing on confirmed guest lists. Neither am I, Bruce mumbles darkly, shouldering on his coat and glancing up at the cloudy, moonless sky. Oh, I didn't turn the page, did I? Ah! I'm leaving you all hanging. Bunny would probably be around a few months old if this does take place in September of 2003, as I'm currently suspecting. I don't. I don't think it's. I don't think this is uh, in 2003. I think it's. I think it's more towards like the 90s, uh, late 90s, like still in the TNBA era. From what I've heard, there's confirmation in this book that Tim is still a 13 year old. Um, so that would be the only place that it would uh, that it would go. If that is the case. Let's see. Um, Neither am I, Bruce mumbles darkly, shouldering on his coat and glancing up at the cloudy, moonless sky. As he follows me down to the car, I am momentarily distracted by a delusional fantasy of a happily ever after for Gotham's Dark Knight. Replete with wedding bells, the pitter-patter of little feet, by the time I am closing the back seat door behind him, though my mind is clearing... The bride would be wearing skin-tight latex and carrying a bullwhip. The groom would no doubt wait at the altar with a bitter frown and handcuffs. And the children? Well, I suppose there are children in a matter of speaking. First and most prominently, young Master Dick, who came to Master Bruce and me at the age of eight after the tragic murder of his parents. That's interesting. Robin's Reckoning, um, the, the credits say that he's either nine or ten depending on which part of Robin's Reckoning you're, you're watching. And uh, they don't make sense with each other. It doesn't make sense for him to like be 9 in one and 10 in the other. Um, but having 8, you know, specifically laid out in a, in a book, I, I feel like I would be more inclined to go with that than... Oh! Who calling me? My, uh... I should probably just turn that down just in case. My, I, I, I got really high one day and started wondering why nobody has ringtones anymore like we did back in 2009. And then I thought it would be funny to switch it to Soldier Boy. And then I never switched it back and I, I keep forget it, forgetting it. This predicted Tom King's wedding thing. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, th I think they've been playing around with the Batman Catwoman marriage for a while. They did that in the in Perchance to Dream as well. Um, let's see. Where was I? Young Master Dick, who came to Master Bruce and me at the age of eight after the tragic murder of his parents. My idea of incorporating him into our home was to provide him with clean sheets, three hot meals a day, and all the parental adoration I was never permitted to lavish on Master Bruce. Master Dick's idea of inte integrating himself into our daily lives was to force us, as much as he could, into the recognizable configuration of a family, filling our days with his natural aff affability, cheer, and affection, not to mention a truly stunning array of questions and endless curiosity. And Master Bruce's idea of assimilating him into our routine was to dress him up in a mask, cape, and short green trunks, enlist him into his holy war, and train him as an assistant crime fighter, or sidekick. Thus was the legend of Robin the Boy Wonder born. I have never completely forgiven Master Bruce for so ruining Master Dick's chances at a normal life. But then, Master Dick has never quite forgiven me for not allowing him to begin the whole enterprise earlier. I suppose that even I must concede that if there is such a thing as a natural for this kind of work, Master Dick fits the bill wholeheartedly. And too, like a real son, he eventually grew up and left us. Master Bruce surprised me greatly by enlisting another young orphan, Master Timothy Drake into the role of Robin, and Master Dick surprised me not at all by returning with a new costume and moniker of his own. He now goes by Nightwing to Gotham and to Master Bruce's aid. Recently, too, a young woman has asserted herself into the boys' club. She asks to be referred to as Batgirl. But Master Bruce knows her to be Barbara Gordon, daughter of his best friend, Gotham City's police commissioner. Let me flip the page...
Oh god, I haven't listened, watched a Plinkett review in a while. I uh, I was really into his Star Wars reviews like way back in the day when they first came out. I think I watched those like on the the Plinkett website rather than YouTube. It was uh, at the time it was it, it seemed like a really um, like kind of a, 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 a like cutting edge thing for creator content. Nowadays, looking back at it, it's just like oh yeah, that's a thing that happened. Let's see. I really cannot overemphasize the importance of these allies in Batman's life. He is a dark and driven existence, and whether working as de facto captains in his anti-war army, or simply providing him with perspective and companionship, these young men, the young lady, Commissioner Gordon, and myself are, in some sense, all that Batman has. Unless you count Gotham itself, which is as real and vital to Batman as we are, Master Bruce is silent as I drive north up the Aparo Expressway towards Burnley. The long-stemmed red roses are now clutched in one of his large hands, and his mood is foreboding. This is a difficult night for him. The most difficult night of the year. This is the anniversary of the Wayne's murders. Earlier this evening, Master Bruce visited the graveyard behind Wayne Manor, leaving flowers there before the large granite tombstones that reads... Thomas and Martha Wayne, in loving memory. Wait. So, their graves are on Wayne Manor, which means Andrea would have been in the Wayne Manor graveyard, I guess? I don't know if that makes sense. That's alright. Um, let's see. He does not consider his morning ritual complete. However, until he has also left flowers at the very spot where they were brutally gunned down almost 30 years ago now. And of course, once this mission is accomplished, he will not take the night off. Batman never takes the night off. Never. Despite the debt he, she owes him, Gotham City has not c come to a consensus on her Dark Knight detective. To many, he is nothing more than an urban legend, a tale contrived to frighten young hoodlums and ne'er-do-wells. Even among the believers, there is dissent. Some claim that Batman himself is responsible for the methods and motivations of the very villains he fights. This is an interesting argument, and one I sometimes find difficult to refute. Many of the more fanatical delinquents he engages with do seem to be somehow inspired by him. They join him in masquerade, taunt him, and set up schemes solely for his consideration and response. Would their criminal insanity have found less lethal expression had they not sought to pit themselves against their own personal huntsmen? Alfred, police scanner, please. Master Bruce's voice, as it comes from the back seat, has transformed again, dropping a full octave and taking on a gravelly, menacing quality I associate with his alter ego. Indeed, the Batman costume is in a briefcase in the trunk, and will be fished out presently. I oblige the request, despite my stated preference for Brahms, and muse one of the f and muse on the fact that although Bruce Wayne can hardly bring himself to remember her name, Batman could tell you exactly where Miss Ulrika resides, when she arrived in Gotham, and when she is expected to leave. In addition to giving you detailed information on her age, height, weight, distinguishing features, medical history, and any relevant criminal records, I wonder I wonder which of these two men she would truly prefer. At last, we reach Park Row, better known as Crime Alley. Master Bruce steps out of the car and disappears with the roses and disappears with the roses into the shadows of the alley while I go around to the back of the rolls to fetch the bat suit. I remember feeling a vague wave of horror the first time I saw the Batman guys. It is, I suppose, a calculated effect. The costume is made primarily of a dark gray weave of bulletproof Kevlar and fire-resistant Nomex. A large black bat is spread across Batman's massive chest. His feet clad in black boots, 
his hands gloved in spiky black gauntlets, the entire effect completed by a combination cape and cowl. The cape is dark, swirling armored shadow that drapes from his shoulder to his ankles. The black cowl, complete with two pointed bat ears on top, covers his throat and two thirds of his face. The only bright color is a yellow utility belt worn around his waist, and any criminal knows that this is not to be mistaken for a pleasant accessory. I am frowning over the costume as Master Bruce emerges from the alleyway, hands now empty, face stricken with sorrow and grief. I swallow as I see him, my heart going out to this gentleman whom I have known since his infancy. This kind and decent human this kind and decent human being who would sooner cut off his own arm than hurt a fly. How do I explain, then, the transformation that occurs as he takes the costume out of my hands, disappears back into the shadows, and then reappears as a demon of vengeance, handing me an empty tuxedo and preparing to unleash himself onto the night? With his heart already full of pain, Batman will spend the rest of the evening fighting for Gotham's safety, whether that includes citywide patrols and the apprehension of petty criminals, or a grand eccentric battle with any one of the endless parade of costume villains who haunt our knights here, such as the notorious Joker, Crown Prince of Crown, isn't it supposed to be Clown? Clown Prince of Crime, or tw the Twisted Riddler, a social terrorist with a bizarre sense of fair play. Perhaps I will explain this fracture simply by holding the connection between the two myself, no matter how divorced they may seem. Yes, it is true that Bruce Wayne is really chiefly a disguise for Batman, an act he plays to divert suspicion. But it is also true that Batman was born of Bruce Wayne's anguish, and so, like all the things in Gotham City, must be assumed to carry inherent contradictions. As he swings off into darkness on a grapnel line, I must also assume that Batman carries Bruce Wayne's heart, a terrific vulnerability and also an incalculable asset. I do hope the knight is kind to him. So that ends chapter one. Uh, we learned a lot about Alfred and his views on Batman as a whole. So that was pretty interesting. Uh, Thomas Wayne seems like the type of guy who'd let his family's graveyard be used for other grieving families such as the Beaumonts it's not perfect but it's not implausible either yeah I mean that's that's something I'm thinking of it's also possible that like the um <clears throat> the graveyard itself might just be like right outside of the bat the grounds of Wayne Manor um and you know just kind of be the fancier graveyard in Gotham um something interesting about Devin Grayson's that she became a fan of the DCU through BTS and TMBA. So things like the Multigon reference could come from her just being a big fan. That makes a lot of sense. I uh, I, I don't think I'd ever heard of Devin Grayson outside of this um, outside of this book. So that's interesting to hear. So now we've got the uh, we got the spreadsheet. We got the spreadsheet. We got to plug some notes in. And there's, there's a lot of notes. I feel like because of how long these chapters are, um, I kind of forget some things while I'm scanning back through. So I might even have to, like, you know, give them a second reading off of the, uh, off of the stream. But let's, let's go back through and, um, and try to, try to, try to get our notes. So we got, you know, um, I think... We've already got, yeah, Batman and Bruce Wayne's in the top one, so I'm not worried about adding him again. But we do have back on, let me pull up the pages again. Back on the first page, we've got a mention of Thomas and Martha Wayne. Um, oh. And let's see, we've got a Rolls Royce, so I will put that in the objects, because that's a, that is a specific type of car. Um, the Mahan Opera House. Oh, 
we didn't really we weren't really at Wayne Manor. I was expecting we would be because of the chapter title, but that's fine. Uh it was mentioned at least. Uh so the Mayhan Opera House. Um just Gotham City in general. Well, I got Gotham City up there. No need to, to have it twice for one book. Um the Opera House is a huge 16th century stone structure. So that's that would go under our time. Let me see. Let me insert some rows below so that I can have it kind of look neat. Uh, there are a decent amount of references to time in this chapter. Mm hmm. One too many R's. Let's see. It's located directly off of Grand Street, neatly demarcating where the financial district meets City Hall. Okay, so Grand Street. Do I have the financial district mentioned? No, yes, I do, but I do not have City Hall itself. I have the City Hall District. Uh, some of the city's more colorful 400 year history. And let's see, I want to say that there was a mention of how old the city was in, what was it? Was it, uh, was it the Mr. Freeze episode or was it the Creeper episode? I, I, it was, it, it had to have been the Mr. Freeze episode. Was it, what was the name of that? Cold Comfort, I think. Cold Comfort, uh, DCAU. Devin Grayson wrote the Nightwing comics for a while and Batman Gotham Knights in the early 2000s, if I remember correctly. Okay, gotcha. I, I, I probably have some of her some of her books in um, in my long box, but it's it's been a while since like I've actually gone through and tried to like read what I own. Um, most of it was left to me by an old roommate, and I had to even like get rid of a lot of that whenever. I left town to move up here. Uh, so I've never gone through all of it to read, but I'll definitely have to look into that. Um, let's see, where is it? It's, it's like a centennial or something was going on. Gotham Tricentennial Celebration. Bum, bum, bum. Tricentennial is 300. There we go, already, not canon. Wait. Where's um, uh, where's my where's my non-canon? Let me see. Where's that supposed to be? At least, let me pop over to another. Non-canon should be after appearances before it content. Okay, gotcha. Insert. Where's a column? Column to the left. Uh, merge those. Non canon. Mm -hmm. Cold comfort, we're told. It's Gotham's tricentennial. Alfred says. Gotham is 400 years old on, what is that, page 17? On page 17. There we go.
For all we know, Alfred could get it wrong. That's not like a cannon breaker, but it's definitely like something worth having. Um, let's see. East Coast, Gotham 300, blah, 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 blah. They're attracting a few, let's see, Metropolis and New York are mentioned. I'm just gonna, since this is a smaller, I'm just gonna put M for mentioned. Metropolis mentioned and New York City mentioned. Let me correct that E. Yeah, this is we're back on. Well, I guess. I guess you can't really see the pages if I have the the spreadsheet open, so I'm not sure that matters much. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it. Gotham is the city of cities, the American dream. So America is mentioned. Well, I guess technically America, we're in Gotham and Gotham's in America. So that's, okay, the three main and six minor islands between the Gotham and Sprang rivers. So Gotham River. Sprang River, of course, being a reference to Dick Sprang. Uh, let's see. Most of the nation associates our city with South Gotham Island. Let's see. Then we've got Old Gotham, Midtown, and the Upper East Side. I guess most of these places are just mentioned, though. So let me copy and paste that little boy. I'm going to say that we're probably on South Gotham Island. One of the best runs on the Titans and an awesome Arsenal miniseries. I remember reading an interview with her on Newsarama or maybe CBR talking about how much she loves Nightwing. Huh. I'm going to I'm going to have to look more into her because like I'm really loving uh how this book is going so far. So she seems to have a good head on her. Uh 24 hour town. Let's see. The Bowery. What is Is Bowery like an actual Bowery is a street in New York. What is what is just the definition of Bowery? Mm. Bowery was once notorious for its saloons, petty criminals, and derelict. Okay, well, I guess we just have to assume that despite New York existing... And the Bowery is also a place in Gotham. And so is the Coventry. Uh, Plaza Stone units. It is a city full of contradiction. Oh, uh, ba 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 Wayne family came from Scotland. I just recently read a book. What was it? Like Batman, the, the Irish connection, the Scottish connection, something like that. Where like it went into his, his roots in that area of the, the world. Um... The Wayne family came from Scotland in the 1700s. I should probably be putting page numbers with this stuff. Just to 
make it easier to refine. Gleam. Okay, we got the valet boy. Wait, that's places. We need people. Um, Gotham State University is mentioned here. Valet is about 20. Not that we will ever need to know that. But now we do. Because you never know what you need to know until you need to know it. Let's see. We've got the Gotham Gazette, which I will list as an object. It's not a place, it's not a person. Let me click the box. Let's see, he tells Alfred he only wants to be in for 15 minutes. That doesn't really matter yet. Let's see, Bruce's eyes, Bruce Thomas Wayne. That's a, did we ever get confirmation anywhere else that Bruce's middle name is Thomas? Like inside the, Bruce's middle name is Thomas. Let's see. You know what? Alternate looks. Bruce Wayne, black silk tuxedo. Um, and you know what? I'll just put Bruce Wayne, page 19. And if James is interested in it, he can look it up. There we go. Uh, it says the annual fundraiser for the Gotham City Rainforest Endowment. Let's say... I'm going to just put Gotham City Rainforest Endowment as an object. I don't know. Um, that's on page 20. Back over you guys real quick. Didn't she have that blockbuster arc where Nightwing was sexually assaulted on the rooftop after believing he murdered someone? That's all. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Gotham has a rainforest, rather difficult to explain. Let's see the opera house. We've already got that mentioned, yes. Uh, let's see. Truth of the matter is Bruce Wayne is Batman. I thought my world was ending when at the age of 26 I was summoned from the stage of... Okay.
Alfred went to America at the age of 26. That's on page 21. They're just giving us, like, so much information in this book. It's, it's kind of wild. Um, Lyceum Theater in London. Engaged then in a thrilling run of King Lear as Edmund. There's some pop culture. Alfred played Edmund in King Lear. Oh, I gave Alfred two A's. So how are y'all all enjoying quarantine? You've been having fun? Let's see, Bastard Son of Gloucester. Was King Lear based on anything real? Because if not, if not, I feel like I don't need to put these people as mentioned. But King Lear is a tragedy written by William Shakespeare. It tells the tale of a king who bequeaths his power and land unto. We declare it. Uh. Okay, so I'm going to assume that since Shakespeare is the first thing that pops up and not the King Lear himself, that these are not real people. However, I do believe I should put William Shakespeare into the other character since he's the one who created this. William Shakespeare uh, indirectly mentioned. You know what? Let me just take the mentioned off of there and then I'll just gotta have it looking fresh let's please promise he extracted from me on his deathbed turned out to entail a lifelong sacrifice as opposed to a brief blah, blah, blah. in the grand tradition of fathers before him Ephraim Pennyworth wanted his son to take over the family business you know what I think now that I now that I'm thinking about it I just realized that Alfred's father's first name is the name of Alfred's voice actor. So that's that was probably intended, I assume. Quarantine's fine, except for the homework. Yeah, yeah, no, that's killing me too. Um, Trying to trying to deal with college has been nonsense. I can't retain anything in online classes. Lear's based on an ancient king named Lyre from the eighth century, according to Google. Huh. I, I may go back and deal with that later, but like, I don't know. It's uh the characters from that play specifically don't exist, you know. So I'm not worrying about. Uh, let's see. Already been educated in the ways of the manservant. Let's see. Okay. Now his long ass school name. The Ivor Spencer International School for Butler Administrators. International School for Butler administrators slash personal assistants and estate managers. Talk about a long school name. I'm having to write that on everything. Who is, you know, who is Ivor Spencer? Let's see, is that a real person? There's a chef, and then there's Lord Ivor Spencer Churchill. I wonder which one makes more sense. 
the chef. The chef makes sense. Born in 1924 and died in 2009. Okay. We're going to we're going to count Ivor Spencer as a character. Let's see, which is why of course I immediately joined the Royal Air Force. Where would I put Royal Air Force? I guess it's a it's a group of people. See, never been a violent man. And then the British Secret Intelligence Service. Secret Intelligence Service mentioned. You know what? Let's. Oh, come on. Let's make it fit. Let's make it fit. Let's make them all fit. That's a little too far. Dial it back a little bit. There we go. That's good. I don't like that that Ivor Spencer thing is taking up so much space. There we go. Now it's only three lines. Oh, let's see. Let's see. Taking over Wayne Manor. Let's see. Thomas and Martha. Oh, wait, hold on. I totally missed. There was a gunman mentioned at the start, wasn't it? Simple as a robbery, clan perpetrated, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So. I'm going to put that Joe Chill was mentioned. Although that was kind of indirectly. But it is what it is. Written in bullets and blood eight years later when my employers were shot to death in a Gotham City alleyway. Eh, don't come with me. Um, let's see. So, Bruce was eight when his parents died. We already know that. We did the whole Bruce's age video that talks about that from time to time. Uh, let's see. Okay, Wayne Manor was mentioned. Built high enough. And Wayne Manor is in the Bristol district. Gotham River meets the Atlantic. I've got Gotham River. So, Atlantic Ocean. Just lots of, lots and lots of locations. And Bruce was six when he saw the bat. To the bat cave when he saw the bat cave um now there was an issue of batman adventures let me see if i can find it welcome to our digital library on google drive that i probably shouldn't be showing you guys but that's okay I need to figure out this this Bruce finding the Batcave situation. I could probably pull it up faster on my phone. I know it was in Batman Adventures. 
you guys are getting to see behind the scenes. James, Ted, and I share like all of digital scans of everything. Uh, was it in issue 34, 35, or 36? I can't remember. I'm going to go with, let's go with 35. I think 34 is the one where his memory gets zapped. And 35, I think he gets, like, Alfred's dad in the comics was named Jarvis, presumably as a reference to his closest counterpart in the Marvel Universe. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, let's see. Where is it? Nope, it's not in this issue. Let's check out... Check out 36. It is. No, that's the page that became a meme. Was it in 34? Or is it just like in the bottom of a page that like is being cut off? I didn't even think about that. Oh, crap. It might have been in 35. Let's check 34 real quick first. Let's see. Is Hugo Strange? Yeah, no, it wouldn't be in that. We're going to give 35 one more quick look, and if it's not in there, I'll just make a note to look for it later. Let's see this Hugo. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Does it not say his age? Oh, I was only six years old. Okay, so that works. Sweet. Okay. Uh, so let me put that in the continuity. Uh, Bruce found the Batcave at six years old. Corroborated in Batman Adventures. Number 35. Tight. Okay. Let's see, where was I in the pages? There I was. Let's see, he later told us blah, blah, blah. It was the only time as a child. Different kind of harbinger. Master Bruce has been inside for four and a half minutes. So, on page 24, it's only been four and a half minutes. So now we're at like 11.46 there. Oh, I need to insert some more rows. Let's squeeze them in. Okay. Bruce was only eight when his parents were killed. We got that already. He was with them. Dreadful night walking home from the theater. They had just been to see The Mark of Zorro. I'm gonna put the Mark of Zorro as an object. Wait, no, hold on. Mark of Zorro is pop culture. Uh, does that line up? Um, does that line up with epilogue? I know. I know epilogue shows... No, it wasn't epilogue. Frick. It was... 
Um, the one with the parasite. For the man who has everything. I know they see a Zorro movie. But I'm blanking if it was Mark of Zorro. It probably was. Uh, Zorro. Give me the details, DCAU wiki. That never has everything, but has most of the things that someone would want. For the man who has most of the things that someone would want. The Justice League episode. Zorro. Mark of Zorro. Okay. Tight. Let me put that as a continuity point. Bruce and his fam watched Mark of Zorro corroborated in for the man who has everything. There we go. Oh yeah, Park Row. We've talked about Park Row slash Crime Alley. Certain the exact particulars. See, Thomas Wayne resisted. Bruce Wayne's mother, Martha. For years, he moved through his days like a somnambulist. Uh, I don't, that doesn't need to. One morning, he came down to breakfast with his jaw set and a new steely intensity in his eyes. He expressed a sudden feverish interest in his education, began to arrange travel, began a systematic process of self-governing reinvention mm. okay so this is saying Bruce uh, trained for 10 years I feel like that doesn't line up with something but I don't remember what it might have just been like a bio from the the new Batman adventure site um, Europe India and Japan Europe gets a mention India gets a mention Japan gets a mention Have you seen The Mask of Zorro? It's basically just Batman Beyond. I, I haven't seen a Zorro movie in so long. I do not remember which um, which ones I have seen. To be fair, mixing up which Zorro movie with a word beginning with M in the title is actually would be easy for basically anyone, even actual Zorro fans. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. Um, like they made uh, they made. The Batman Beyond 2.0 uh, Phantasm Arc is called Mark of the Phantasm. That's, that stuff's easy to get mixed up, especially if you're typing quickly or something. I, I would be willing to, you know, let it slide um, if it were, if it ended up actually being inconsistent. Suppose that Master Bruce returned home. Instead, he came home darker than ever. It's time to rescue my employer on page 26. Fifteen minutes have passed by page 26. That was a fast 11 minutes. By page 4 it was 4 minutes. By page 26 he's like, alright, I'm out. Opera House, the rolls. Okay. Cartier is capitalized. So is that a brand? Like a brand of wine or something?
French luxury goods conglomerate. Interesting. Okay, so it is a brand. Uh, brand that's been around since 1847. I will put it in objects. Quick word with the doorman. Oh, whoa. Why is that all up? I don't need that. I must have hit some kind of quick keys. So we have a, a doorman as mentioned. And then a catering manager. Then we have Ulrika. Request at the Sultan's Soiree. I don't know who the Sultan is. Keep going on about Ulrika. Oh, wait, who, where was she from? It said she was Swedish, was it? Swedish. So, Sweden is mentioned as a place. Sweden mentioned. Orika's from out of town, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here we go. We get the Wayne Enterprises. Uh, stuff. Let's see. Wayne Enterprises, LexCorp, Multigon. Um. And then we get Wayne Tech, Wayne Chemical Refinery, and the Wayne Foundation. Wayne Chemical Refinery. And Wayne Medical. Okay. And given that we've got Lex Corp, I'll put Lex Luthor as a mentioned character. And I got multi on already, yeah. Let's see. Then we got Lucius Fox is mentioned. Rolodex is capitalized. I assume that's a brand. I know what a Rolodex is, but I think it was a specific brand of that product as well. I want to know what Bruce got up to in India. Did he observe Indian contortionism along the future elongated man? Did he meet the person who supplies tigers and snakes to villains to use in their schemes? The world needs to know. Um, I'm not sure. It, would Nanda Parbat count as India? Because if so, like, don't we learn in Wake the Dead that um, was it was it Wake the Dead? No, Dead Reckoning. Whichever one it was that had Dead Man in it. Like, didn't we learn that uh, Bruce trained in Nanda Parbat, uh, which might be India? I I don't I I don't know the geography specifically. A Rolodex. 
Okay, so we have three charming women. One of them was Bunny. And another was Jody. But we never got to learn the third one's name. Is it just J-O-D-I-E? Yeah. Bunny, Jody, third woman. I'm going to put Bambi as mentioned because I know we have Miss Bambi and the DCAU. And then we've got the Alps. Oh, yeah. I probably should put all the mentioned next to these. Selena Kyle is mentioned as a love interest, nonetheless. So that's interesting. Didn't we have somewhere something somewhere saying that the, the murder was 30 years ago? Did I miss that skimming back over? Let's see, we've got Dick Grayson mentioned. Good job, Robin. Oh, hey, there's a new follower. Thanks for following. You're catching it towards the end of this. I'm just taking notes. You missed the the. You missed the story itself, but that's fine. We're glad to have you here anyway. Uh, so let's see. It says it says that Dick was eight when his parents died. Robin's reckoning credits suggest nine or ten. And then let me put that. In the time his parents died, and that's on page 31. All right, just slinging through this. We're at 31 and 35. Let's see. I like that it says that Alfred was the one responsible for Dick um, not going out like immediately. Uh, so I guess, I guess he's the one to blame for the six to seven years of training we see mentioned in Batman Adventures. And then we've got Tim Drake. They, they go all the way, they call him Timothy. I'm just going to call him Tim, because if I'm looking for him, I'm not going to go and search Timothy slash Robin mentioned. And then after that, we've got um, Batgirl slash Barbara Gordon. And it says she's a recent addition, too. And Commissioner Gordon is mentioned as her father. Let's see. The Aparo Expressway towards Burnley. Is that how they spelled Aparo? Yeah, Aparo. Expressway towards Burnley. Is it, 
It is the... This is the anniversary of the Wayne's murders. Okay. So we've, uh... We've assumed that this was on the... That the game was on the anniversary just because of the, um... The roses, but it's nice to know... that it is confirmed. So I guess that it occurs in fall in the DCAU. Nanda Parbet's in Tibet. Okay. Eight works better thematically with Bruce, but nine slash ten is arguably more canon since it was in an actual episode. Yeah, I mean, it's, um... Like I said, they, uh, the, the the credits for both like disagree with each other and if i remember like the one where it says he was 10 is um is set like that flashback is set before the one where he's nine so it's it's not like it's not clear at all um it's definitely interesting that they went with eight here um let's see graveyard behind Wayne Manor. I'll put that as a location. And okay, there's the 30 years. Uh Insert one or two more rows, just in case. Wayne murder was almost 30 years ago. Page Alfred was enjoying listening to Brahms. I forget the composer's first name. Johannesy. Okay. Tight. I'll just copy that over. Enchant and pop him in as as pop culture as well let's see at last we reach park row ba -ba. kevlar and fire resistant nomex what is nomex i mean i guess it's a fire retardant but it's Capitalized. Nomex is an example of a meta variant of. Okay. So it's just kind of. It's, it's like Kevlar, but for fire. It's not like a brand or anything. Uh, let's see. This costume. See, we get the mention of the Joker, the mention of the Riddler, but we've already got them last uh, last chapter. Uh, I think that's everything. There was... Wasn't there a mention... I feel like there was a mention uh, of, like, the first time that Alfred saw him in the... Okay, 
Well, that's fine. Um, I know. Let me let me scroll back a little bit. Because now that I'm thinking about it, there were a couple things. Um, where was the part where he talked about the bat? Yeah, Bruce was six when he saw the bat. Um, uh, where is... He later told us the bat had shuffled out of the darkness towards him. His name's scared. As a child. Much later, th yeah, uh, there it is. Another bat much later smashed through the study window while Master Bruce contemplated ways of intimidating the criminal element he hunted. Okay. Another bat much later. smashed through the window the study window come on master bruce contemplating ways of intimidating criminal element he hunted. Now I know this came up in in a, a Batman Superman magazine issue. We can get rid of will this go away? Yeah, okay. It likes taking its time. Where is there? It is Superman and Batman magazine. Oh shoot! Which one's gonna have? Which one's gonna have his origin? I know, I, I don't think it's issue one. It's not this one. That's a different Batman story in here. Oh, shoot. I went back all the way. Crud. Let me see. about issue three? It'd probably be so much faster to go through these on my phone, but I deleted them from my phone. Nope. That one's not Batman. It's Superman and the Atom. Is it issue four? I think issue four's got Robin on the cover, so that might make sense. No, it's not that one either. Superman, Hawkman. I would be upset if it did end up being issue one. But I'm pretty sure there was one that had a Superman origin and a Batman origin, and it came later in. That's a Penguin Scorn, so that's not right. I tell you what, they really, like, they did a bunch of just, like, short Batman Adventure-style stories and then put them in other places. Like, they had three or four of them in this magazine. And then they had one in a Fox Kids, maybe more multiple, and, like, a Fox Kids had their own magazine. And then they had one in the back of Adventures in the DC Universe. Oh, my God. Watch it have been... 
Watch it have been issue one. Yeah, because this is this is where the Justice League comes in. Crud. It might have been issue one. I skipped. Yep, here it is. Found it. There we go. There's the bat crashing in. Okay, so. Corroborated in Batman Superman Magazine issue one. Uh, and then let's see, at one point, Alfred recalls the first time he saw the suit. Scene in Mask of the Phantasm. Okay, so I think that's I think that's it for for the notes. I'm gonna delete these rows. Well, yeah, get rid of those, and then I'll I'll tidy all that up later. But yeah, that's it for the notes. That's it for you know the stream today. Uh, I should figure out a way to do this that's maybe a bit more, uh, have not, not just piling the, the, the back end with the notes and the front end with the, the, the book, maybe just take the notes as we go, going forward, but it is what it is. Um, we're going to go ahead in the stream here and i will see you guys that are left um next week oh danny's got a question if you find material within a non-canon piece of media about an established dcau character that doesn't contradict anything does that become semi-canon or get thrown out um i think it depends on a couple factors um like for 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 the sake of, say, like, Batman Adventures Volume 2, how, like, almost everything fit canon except for, like, issue 17, like, didn't line up with the timeline of, like, Mask of the Phantasm. It's, it's like, a thing of, like, maybe that exact story took place within canon, but with slightly different details. You know, something like, something like that. Um, like, like, details that did take, like line up with the timeline or whatever but to say that it's canon as it stands is kind of kind of silly in my mind um but then like there's stuff like there's the there's a superman adventures issue that deals directly with supergirl um where it's kind of split into two parts um there there's a section of her living on argo up before the uh b before the events of little girl lost and then there's like just a, a splash page of like the events of that episode and then being like see the episode for more and then after that you get you know the new story like like the all the all the stuff that they wanted to actually tell a story of um and like the story itself deals with supergirl being immune to kryptonite if I recall correctly, I think she's immune to kryptonite there, but like we ended up learning in Justice League that that's not the case, etc., etc. Um, but that issue was written by the people who wrote Little Girl Lost. Uh, so we, for the most part, we take the backstory at least as like what was intended to be, whereas like the rest of it is just like, no, this doesn't fit. Even though, like, in the backstory, like, she has a poster of Wonder Woman up on her wall and Wonder Woman's not even around yet. So, it, it's, um, it's, it's a bit dicey with stuff like that. Some, sometimes some sections can, uh, can work. Other times they can't really. I'm just wondering because I really want all this Alfred stuff to be canon, even if this book as a whole isn't canon. Yeah, I mean, so far, so far it seems like, um... It seems like it makes a lot of sense for it to stay uh, within within the canon. It makes sense to me um, for it to, to be. I mean, so far, really, the only thing we've got goofing it up is, like, 
Gotham being around 400 years instead of 300 years, which could just be, a, you know, explained away as, like, a misremembering or something. Um, and then, like, the thing with Dick Grayson's age. So, hopefully, hopefully we can come up with, with ideas as to how, like, more often than not, um, James and I whenever we we formulate will it canons we try to come up with explanations for why things fit um despite looking as if they don't fit um and like with with stuff you know like the like the 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 what crisis on infinite earths or superman brainiac attacks crisis on two earths that's what i meant or superman brainiac attacks like there there will be stuff that is just like there's too much to to say you know that that it can work um but more often than not we go in like wanting to make it work uh especially if it's something that's actually in the dcau style um so the one thing that like i try to not give wiggle room is just mentions of time um just you know due to the fact that if if you if you do that if you start doing that if you say like oh they said you know x amount of years here but in reality it, it's got to be this amount of years or whatever if you start doing that then like the whole timeline breaks apart because it's just like well then what's the point of you know taking any of it literally uh, I'm, I'm more willing to, like, forgive, like, the 300, 400 year, just because, like, it's such a wildly, uh, wildly large amount of time, but, you know, it is also, like, they're at the, they're at the turn of the century, so it could be, like, oh, you know, it was, it was built in the 1600s, and, like, we're close to 2000, so I'm thinking 400 years, but really... It was the late 1600s, so it's actually 300 years. Stuff like that. But yeah. Um, we will figure out a way to make it work. <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, but that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get off. It's been about two hours. Um, from what I understand, Twitch doesn't like saving streams that are longer than two hours. So i got to be sure to keep all, keep all that going. Um, I'm going to go get some lunch. And maybe watch some movies so y'all have a y'all have a good rest of your day i will see you uh next week when we come back for chapter two all right love y'all